That day for me was March 15, 1970. I realized I was a sinner, couldn't go to heaven on my own, couldn't go because my parents were going, but I needed to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that very evening, I put my faith and trust in Christ. The good news of the gospel is, if you've not yet done that, you still can, uh, because God says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm glad and grateful for God's invitation to all people everywhere to be saved. I invite you to take your Bible with me and go to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 8 this morning is where we will be during our time together in God's Word. We return to the study of the life of David, a man after God's own heart. And this morning we're in 2 Samuel chapter number 8, and we'll be looking at this chapter in its entirety. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're in 2 Samuel chapter number 8, verse number 1. And it said, and after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took meth out of the hand of the Philistines, and he smote Moab, and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, even with two measures, uh, two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David smote also Hadad. Dezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, as he went to recover the border, his border at the river Euphrates. If you'll skip down, it says in verse number five, and when the Syrians of David came to succor Hadad Dezer, the king of Zobah, David slew the Syrians, two and twenty thousand men. If you look down to verse number nine, then Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the host of Hadad-Dezer. Had then Toi sent Joram, his son, and King David to salute him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadad-Dezer and smitten him. And if you go down to verse number 12, it says of Syrian and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and the spoil of Hadad-Dezer, son of Roha. Uh, these are names, aren't they? <laughs> if you think you can do better, come on up, okay? <laughs> they get to rolling together after a while, don't they? Rehob, a king of Zobah. And David got him a name when he returned from the smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, Put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for the scriptures, the Bible, the word of God. Uh, you inspired men and you have preserved it through the ages so that with full and complete confidence we open these pages this morning knowing that they are your word and your word was written for a purpose that which you recorded in historical narratives like we're in today was not haphazard, but it was rather instructive. Paul said to the Corinthians that all things that happened to Israel happen for our exhortation. And so I pray today that you'll use your word in our lives in this hour, in our day. Lord, I pray that you draw sinners to repentance. I pray you'd encourage your people today through the scriptures. And we'll thank and praise you for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. If you have been with us as we've journeyed through David's life, you know that in the second book of Samuel, we have seen several things come to pass. David has been anointed the king of Judah and ultimately the king over all of Israel in 2 Samuel chapter number 5. In chapter number 6, David had a heart to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which was the central piece of worship in the tabernacle, to Jerusalem, and God enabled him to do exactly that. In chapter number 7, it began by David exclaiming to Nathan the prophet that God had placed it in his heart to build God a house, a place where he could be permanently worshipped at that point. Uh, the tabernacle is in Gibeon. The Ark of the Covenant is within a tent. 
in Jerusalem, and David had a great desire that God might have a permanent dwelling place. God did not desire that. As a matter of fact, he makes it quite clear to Nathan that he does not want that. Look back at chapter 7 and verse 5. Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and a tabernacle. He says, uh, David, I, I really have no, no desire for you to build me a house. And, uh, but he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make you a house. Look at verse 8 there in chapter 7. He says, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat. We, that's where we began looking at him back in 1 Samuel chapter 6, keeping his father's sheep when Samuel the prophet came to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons king of Israel. He said, I took you from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel, and I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the, all, that are in the earth. Moreover... I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And what happens on the verses right after what we have read from verse 12 to verse 17, God establishes the Davidic covenant, the covenant that David would always have a king to sit on the throne of Israel. And what I believe we have in chapter 8 this morning is not a chronological record of David's victories, but I believe rather it is a summation or a summary of all that God allowed David to see as he obeyed the Lord. Uh, the Lord gave victories. It's interesting. We won't look at it in a geographical manner, but it's quite interesting. The Lord gave victory first to the west in the Philistines, then to the east in the Moabites, then to the north in the Syrians, and then to the south in the Edomites. Uh, King Saul had fought many of these nations, but had not prevailed against them. 1 Samuel 14, 47 records that. And even though God had promised Israel to have all the land, if you go all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant, we will not go there for the sake of time. Maybe write a little note and look at it later. But Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 18, God told Abraham that his people would have all the land from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. As a matter of fact, he said to Abraham, he said, I will give you all the land whereon you have trodden, the land of Canaan. The truth is, Israel had never possessed all of that land until this hour. They had never fully conquered Canaan. If you even go back to the book of Joshua, which is quite a detailed explanation of how they came in the center of the country, then went to the south, and then finally to the north, you will find that there were many people in those lands that the Israelites did not overcome. And because of that, what they've had from the day of Joshua to the day of David is they have had continual conflict. Now, let me just say to you and I this morning in 21st century America who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth is that if you and I do not walk in the victory that we have in and through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we too will be in a constant turmoil and chaos because we do not obey the Lord. Let me just say, this is God's principle through the Scriptures. Obedience brings victory. Obedience brings victory. And if you and I will not obey the Lord, we cannot expect to benefit from the Lord. We have to do that which we know we ought to do. God had told all these previous generations to conquer the land, to subdue the land, to take over the land, but they had not done so. Yet God would use David 
uh, not only to capture that land that had never been captured by the nation of Israel, but to recapture the land that they had lost under Saul's reign as the king. It is estimated that David expanded the territory of Israel tenfold through the battles that we read of in summation here in chapter 8 of 2 Samuel. Now, if you know anything about David, you know that he was a multifaceted man. <laughs> he was a shepherd. We read that a moment ago in 2 Samuel. He was a songwriter. <laughs> All you have to do is peruse the book of Psalms, and at the title of many of those, at least 70 of those 150 Psalms, it says a Psalm of David. But he was also a soldier. As a matter of fact, one of our probably most famous recollections of David is him as a young boy fighting the giant of the Philistines, Goliath by name, and defeating him in the power of God. And if you were with us when we were back in those early chapters, that's 1 Samuel chapter 17, you know that David was a military leader under Saul and then became a military leader on the run from Saul because Saul turned against him, realized that he had been chosen the replacement for him. Saul hunted him and he was a fugitive for many years. And yet in all of that, David was a soldier. David was one who was willing to make a stand for God. I, I think one of the things that you and I often are missing in our day and hour is we're missing the determination, the grit, whatever you want to call it, to stand. The truth is many Christians have become pacifist. I, I promise you, I promise you that you cannot remove military battles from the Old Testament and have much of a book. Now, now I understand. Listen to me. Listen to me. I understand what Paul said in the New Testament. Our weapons are not carnal. No, they're not carnal. They, we, we're, not, we're not fighting flesh. This is what he said in Ephesians 6. Uh, we don't fight flesh and blood, but we fight principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you understand that though our battle is not a physical battle, it is still as real a battle this morning as it was when David was fighting the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and all them other parasites, okay? It still is real a battle. And, and thanks be unto God, he, he's given us the weaponry. Here's the sword of the Spirit. He's given us the avenue of prayer. He's given us the girdle of of truth. He's given us the breastplate of righteousness. He's given us the shield of faith. He's given us the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're fully equipped this morning. Now, the problem is not that we're not equipped. The, the problem is exactly what David said in Psalm 78 when he was recalling the history of Israel at being armed, it says in the day of battle, they turned back. They turned back. Let's just take yesterday, for instance. Do you realize that probably, I'm not sure, I've never done a research. I want to say 50%. I'm, I think that's being kind. It's probably more like 70% of the churches in Raleigh wouldn't make their way down to an abortion clinic to stand for life. Yesterday, I had to carry one of our young men home after the prayer walk. He lives in a section of town I don't normally go in. And so I'll tell you where it says over there. Wade Avenue, Cameron Village area. I think I went, I know I did by two. I think I went by three churches from Lake Boone Trail to Gardner Drive is a road he lives on. I know I went by two. I think I went by three churches that had gay pride flags out in front. Now, I, maybe, I'm a, maybe I just don't travel in that part of the, of the city. 
Listen to me. There are some things according to the Bible that are right and wrong. Homosexuality and lesbianism is abomination to God. That's what the Bible says. That's what I'm going to believe, okay? So David here is portrayed for, for us in this passage by this thought, from victory unto victory. It's quite interesting when David is given the Davidic covenant in chapter 7, verses 12 through 17. Then in chapter 7, verses 18 through 29, David goes to prayer and yields himself to the Lord, submits himself to the Lord. And what you have here in that chapter 8 is he acting on his faith. Listen to me this morning. Whatever you believe affects your behavior. Whatever you believe, whether you believe the Bible or don't believe the Bible, it affects your behavior. Now, as a Christian, because I believe the Bible, then it affects my behavior. It helps me to want to put my life in line with God's Word. Now, I won't tell you that I walk exactly in lockstep with everything God says, but I want to. And when I don't, the good thing about God is the sweet spirit of God takes the word of God and reminds me that I'm out of step. So we see David from victory unto victory. Two aspects of that. Number one, the scope of the victories. The details of the conquering are given to us here in verses 1 through 14. They, 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 they entail six nations specifically mentioned in our text. He began, interesting enough, in verse number 1 with the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were located to the west of Israel. But, but if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know this. They probably qualify as the most persistent enemy of Israel. They probably qualify as the one who has given Israel the most difficulty and trouble throughout their history since they had gone into the land of Canaan. But it's interesting when David goes there, he goes there first. I believe first because David understood the principle that if you don't conquer your greatest enemy first, then while you're trying to conquer another enemy, the greatest enemy will come and get you. That's true in my life today. It's true in your life today. If, if you and I know we have a great enemy and we, we ignore him or her, I don't know, I reckon ladies call their sins hers, but, but if we ignore, ignore him or her, that sin, you know, you know what's going to happen? When, when we're dealing with these little bitty deals over here, that one's going to come in and just, I mean, he's just going to ram us over and over and over and over again. David understood that. He's a military genius. And he goes in, and it's, what, it's quite interesting what he does. Look at what it says he did there in verse number 1, chapter number 8. And David took meth egg Amah. Well, who is that? Well, I think that's the city of Gath, but it's not called that. I'll tell you what it's called. It's called Meg e meth egg Amah. What does that mean? It means the bridal of the mother city. You know anything about Philistia? Had five major city states in it, Gath being chief. I believe David went and conquered not only his greatest enemy, but he went right into the heart of that greatest enemy and fought against them because he did not want to be vulnerable to other attacks from other places. Then he smoked Moab, it says in verse 2. Now, Moab is to the east, a direct opposite direction from Philistia. M Moab had not always been Israel's enemy. As a matter of fact, if you know about the lineage of David, you know that David's great-grandmother was a Moabitess. Her name's Ruth. You know, all you have to do is read the last four or five verses of the book of Ruth there in chapter 4. His great-grandmother was a Moabite. 
If you've been with us as we've journeyed through the books together of David's life, 1 Samuel 22, he took his mother and his father when he thought their life was in danger, and the king of Moab allowed them to be hidden in his country. It's interesting, isn't it? But now, in verse 2, how does it start off? It says, and he smote Moab. Why? Because despite those times of peace and harmony, Moab was the enemy of God. You remember what Moab did in the book of Numbers? They hired Balaam, a prophet, to curse Israel in chapter 22 of Numbers. But he couldn't do it because God filled his mouth every time. But you know what he did do? He did lead them, according to Numbers chapter 25 and verse 1, to corrupt the land through intermarriage. God had told the Israelites not to marry the people of the Canaan land, not because they were superior to them, but because those Canaanites were worshipers of false gods. Just like God does in the New Testament, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I don't believe a saved person ought to marry an unsaved person. Now, if you're already, already married, uh, you, I don't, I'm not telling you to leave them. I'm telling you that if you're not married, I don't believe that a saved person ought to marry an unsaved person because you're putting two people together that have none of the same principles of life. That's the reason God had done it to Israel. As a matter of fact, you know what Balaam said? I told you God put his word in his mouth. L listen to Numbers 24, 17. This is the words of Balaam, who was not a good man, but spoke truth when God gave it to him. A scepter, and if you'll look in your Bible, that's capitalized, shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab. I, I believe that that scepter is not just David in near fulfillment. I believe it's Jesus Christ in far fulfillment. Fulfillment. As a matter of fact, I believe all of these victories that you and I see in this passage today are given there for us to understand that we're following the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He is victorious. <laughs> I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. If somebody's persuaded you, you got to live under your circumstances, they They've told you something that's contrary to the scriptures. You don't have to, and I don't have to live bondage to our flesh, this world, nor the devil. John said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Then David defeated Zoba, verse 3. That's northeast of Damascus. It's interesting what it says there, isn't it? Look at, look at what it says at the end of verse 3. As he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. Now, now what, what is really interesting if you're, if you're an Old Testament historical student is to know that God uses the word recover, but they had never previously settled there. You know why God uses the word recover? Because God said to Abraham back all the way back in Genesis 15, you're going to have it from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And listen to me, when God promises something, you mark it down, God's going to perform what he promises. You say, well, it had never happened before. Yeah, but that didn't change it in the mind of God. He said, go recover it. <laughs> go get what's rightly yours. And this morning, are you, are you living in the victory that's rightly yours? Are you allowing God to bring in your life that which he wants to bring so that you don't have to walk in defeat, discouragement, despair, depression? He went. And, and, and when he went, the Syrians decided they'd get involved. Now, the Syrians didn't have to get involved. If you were to look at a map, you'd see that he had marched right through the land of the Syrians to get to the land of Zobah. But the Syrians had to get involved. <laughs> so it says, verse number 5, when the Syrians of Damascus came to succor Hadadezer, king of Zobah, <laughs> then David slew of them two and 20,000 men. You know, you know, sometimes people try to get involved in our battles that aren't never get involved in our battles. But can I just say this? You can't withstand God. 
You can't defeat the Lord. He, he, he took it. So get down to verse 9. Toai, the king of Hamath, realizes what's all happened. And Toai's a pretty good, he's a pretty smart man. What did he do there? Verse, verse 10, he, he sent his son to salute David, to bless him. No doubt that means to bring gifts to him. Matter of fact, it says at the end of verse number 10, he brought vessels of silver, vessels of gold, vessels of brass. Toai said, you know what? Looks like to me he's going to win anyway. I might as well go ahead and succumb to him. You know, you and I, live. we'd be a lot better off if that's what we do with God. He's going to win anyway. I might as well submit to him. Then David put garrisons in the land of Edom. That's on the south side. You know the Edomites. They were the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. They would not allow Israel to pass through their land on the way to Canaan. But now they're conquered. They're conquered. It's quite interesting what's said in two occasions. I want you to see it with me. Go to the end of verse 6. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Now go to the end of verse number 14. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. You know what David realized? He realized it wasn't his strength. You and I in the spiritual battle we're in this morning, it's not our strength. As a matter of fact, this is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I remember when I was in Bible college, I was taking a class on the book of Ephesians. And my, my professor, who is actually a former pastor of our church, Dr. Robert Woodard, Dr. Woodard said the power of his might, he described it like an electrical dam. He said uh, the dam holds back his might, all the waters. The, the power is what runs over the dam. In other words, listen to me this morning. God's got plenty more might. <laughs> He's never going to run out of might. He just gives us the power we need. He just gives us the strength we need when we need it. He's just there to enable us to stand when we should stand. Well, it's not a half-hearted issue either because he's, he's not doing it just somewhat because he knows the Lord's going to do it. No, he, look at the words. We, we've read them already, but just look at them again. Smote, that's in verse 1, that's in verse 2, that's in verse 3. Verse 5 is the word slew. The verse 9 is the word smitten. Verse 13 is the word smiting. <laughs> and then after he, after he got through there in verse 6 and verse 4, 14 that we read the end of them what does it say at the beginning of those it says then david verse 6 put garrisons in, in syria of damascus and verse 14 he put garrisons in edom what, what, what is that garrisons were guards to stay behind to guard the victory that he had gained can, can i just say to you that when you and i win a victory in our walk with christ we can't forsake that place and think well it'll be okay no 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 if you want a victory in your, in your walk with the Lord, let's just say in your Bible study, your Bible engagement, where you open the Scriptures and read them and study them and think about them and meditate on them. If you win that victory today and, and you win it tomorrow and you win it next week and you win it next month, it doesn't mean that six months from now you can just quit doing it because you, you got that conquered. No, you got to put a garrison there. You got to put a guard the wise man Solomon said this in Proverbs 4 and 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 36, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And it's interesting what David did and what he got. Look at what he did with his spoils. Verse 11, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord. You know, David understood that what had happened had been done in and through and for God. 
So all the spoils that he received from all of these victories, we have not a full record of how much gold, silver, and brass he received, how many jewels, how, um, what, what, what animals he may have received. We, we don't know the full thing, but he says what he got. Verse 11 says he did dedicate to the Lord. He didn't keep any of it for himself. Why? Because you remember what God had told him he was going to do in chapter 7, verse 13? He told him that he couldn't build the house, the, t the temple, but his son Solomon could build it. And, and from that day, to the day David died. You know what he did? He dedicated himself to fulfill the plan of God and everything he could get, all the gold, all the silver, all the brass, all the, all the, all the clothing, all the, all the linen. He reserved all that up so that when Solomon got ready to build the temple, he could just start the project. So I want you to understand that the scope of David's victory was extensive. <laughs> but he did it all in, through, and for the Lord. The second aspect I want you to see from victory unto victory is the significance of the victories. What, what did this summation of David's military victories do? Look at verse 15. And David reigned over all Israel. Now go back to chapter 5 just a minute. Just leave a Bible marker, put your finger there or something. Go back to chapter 5. Look at verse 4. We'll get the complete context. Verse 4, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem... He reigned 30 and 3 years over all Israel and Judah. Now, remember that. Go back with me to chapter 8 and verse 15. And David reigned over all Israel. What, what, what do you mean then? It already said he reigned over all Israel. Here's the difference. Chapter 5, he's reigning over what is then Israel as far as the Israelites would consider it. Chapter 8. He's reigning over all Israel as, what, as far as what God would consider it. He is now reigning from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, Genesis 15, 18 again. The Lord had brought a dawning of a new day. You know why? Because obedience always brings victory. The people are free. They're not worried about anyone coming in to attack them. They're enjoying the bounty and the blessings of God. Under Saul, there'd been darkness and death, division and strife. Under David, there's peace. There's plenty. There's prosperity. And notice what he did. He, didn't, he just didn't rest on his laurels. Look at it, verse 15. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. Saul had never done that. Saul was not a righteous man. David was. David wanted his people to know judgment and justice. That's what you and I would say, right and righteousness. Saul had been primarily concerned with himself, fulfilling his own plans. David's focus is on the Lord. David understands that it is the Lord who preserved him whithersoever he went. David understood that the focus was on a heart for God and a heart for God. You know what a heart for God did in David's life? Right there you see it in the last four words of verse 15. It gave him a heart for his people. He says he executed judgment and justice unto all his people. What a picture of the rightness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm glad to say to you this morning, our God is right and righteous. Paul, Paul describes in Romans chapter 3 that we are all sinners. And because we're sinners, we, de judge, we deserve judgment and death. But 
Romans chapter 3 says, in order that God would be just and the justifier of all those who would believe, he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. He's just. He demands punishment. But he's a justifier. And he paid the payment in Jesus alone. And the good news is, where sin, self, and Satan once reigned in the heart of those of us who know Christ this morning, the sovereign of the universe and the savior of mankind sits on the throne of our heart. (laughs) David understood that he had to fight some battles. But then the last of the part of the chapter, and we won't, we won't dissect it very much, but the last part of the chapter, he understood he had to maintain that kingdom. A good leader uses wise and skillful people to help him. You don't, you don't, one, one man can't do it all. You know, one of the things I've learned over and over and over and over again uh, these last 25 years of being the pastor of our church is, uh, you know what, if it was dependent on me, it'd all flop and fail. But I've got a staff around me, uh, as Preacher Cox used to say, they, they make a man like me look good. <laughs> well, that's what David understood. David understood, I can't do this. Can, can I just say, God so orders our lives that he never expected us to do it on our own. You know what God does for us? God puts us inside of a local church like Beacon Baptist Church. We have brothers and sisters who come alongside of us, and they help us, and they encourage us, and they exhort us, and maybe sometimes they challenge us. It's okay. It's okay. Sharpen you, the iron of one of your brothers, one of your sisters. You, you see something not light right in their, long, in, in their life. It's all right to, to, to go to them and, and challenge them. David says to Two military leaders, a Joab in verse 16, and then Benaiah in verse 18. Joab's over the whole host, that's the army. Benaiah's over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, which are the personal bodyguards of David, the police of the palace. He, he sets up two men to direct worship, verse 17, Zadok and, and Ahimelech. Why did he put two priests? If you know anything about the Old Testament, you usually one, but put two because most of the furniture was down in Gibeon. The ark was there in Jerusalem. He put two civil officers. He made Jehoshaphat the recorder, verse 16, Sariah the scribe. Most believe that one of them was the secretary of state. The other one was a personal secretary. All of it God did, David did, because he understood that he needed others to help him. Listen to me. Listen to me. Our victory this morning is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, but that doesn't mean that we ought to be fighting the battle all by ourselves. It's even interesting. Verse 18 closes out with a statement that's a little surprising if you know the rest of David's life. What does it say? Look at it. It says his sons were chief rulers. Now, I believe there's a little light shed on that in 1 Chronicles 18, 7, which says of them they were chief about the king. I believe they, 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 that they were people who were around David to assist and help David. And if you know the rest of the story, you know that some of his sons didn't finish well. But, but I think here's the principle that's taught. I, I believe the principle that's taught is this. David knew that if his boys had an opportunity to succeed, they had to serve. Do you understand? As the king's son, they could have been served and not served, but David knew that if they were going to have an opportunity to succeed in life, they too needed to be a servant. So God took him from victory unto victory. Now, if you're familiar, You know, the Psalms are written out of the experiences of David's life. I want you to go with me to the 60th Psalm. Go with me to the 60th Psalm, would you please? Most Bible students would agree that David wrote Psalm 2, Psalm 20, Psalm 21, and Psalm 110 during these conquests that we read about in 2 Samuel chapter 8. But there's only one of those Five Psalms that actually says this was when it's written. You're in Psalm 60, 
Look at the title of the book. It says, To the Chief Musician, Shushan Edoth, Mitchum, that means a psalm of instruction of David to teach. Matter of fact, it even defines Mitch, Mitchum to teach. When he strove with Aram Nahataim, maybe, and with Aram Zopa, when Judah returned and smote of Edom in the valley of salt, 12,000, and that's exactly what it said over there in our text where Edom's mentioned, Salt Valley. I want you to look at it. We don't have time to take it apart, but I want you to look at it with me. Because I believe Psalm 60 brings clarity to where you and I are in spiritual warfare. All right? It starts with David being overwhelmed. Look at verse 1. Oh God, thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. Oh, turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble. Thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Thou hast showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. See law or think about it. Pause and ponder it. That thy beloved may be delivered. Save thy right hand and hear me. David starts off where most of us start off when we get in a spiritual conflict. Where do we start off? Most of us start off in the place where, Lord, I sure can't understand why all this is happening. I sure can't understand all this. I thought I was on the winning side. <laughs> you may never yell at God like that. It's okay if you didn't. It's okay if you did. All right. That's where we usually start at. Lord, why are we here? Now, now, I think David understood why they was there. They were there because of the foolish choices they made under Saul. But he doesn't stop there. It, it's, it, it's, as if, it's as if God then intervenes and speaks. Matter of fact, look at what it says there at verse 6. God has spoken, okay, in his holiness. Here's what God said. I will rejoice. Did, did you know that God has joy even in the midst of our sorrows? And, and, and the good thing about God is he can give us his joy in the midst of our sorrows. You remember what Paul said to the Thessalonians there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? We sorrow not as those who have no hope, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. He said, I will rejoice. God says, I will divide Shechem. I'll meet out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine hand. Judah is my lawgiver. Look here. Here's one of the, here's one of the countries that we just looked at. Moab is my wash pot. God said, I clean my dishes in Moab. Over Edom will I cast off my shoe. Now, now for years, most of us people in America would have never understood that, right? Because that's not something we practice in our culture. But we've even seen it in, in our war with the Middle East. We've seen people take off their shoe and throw it at somebody. That's the greatest insult in that world. Well, you know what God says? God said, I'm going to throw my shoe at Edom. <laughs> wow. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. <laughs> it's almost a sarcastic remark, isn't it? Who will bring me into strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? He, he, he says, you know, God says, I, I, I've got it all in control. Oh, I understand this morning. Listen to me, listen to me. I'm not living in a dream world. I understand this morning that many of us think we're overwhelmed and we don't see a way out. But can I just remind us this morning that regardless of what happens in my situation or my circumstances, God never changes. Never. He's not up and down, hot and cold, on and off. If he was, we'd be in big trouble today. <laughs> so what does David do? He 
goes back now. God's quit speaking in verse 10. I believe it's David again. Wilt, thou, wilt not thou, O God, which has cast us off? And, and thou, O God, which did not go out with our armies, give us help from trouble. For vain is the help of man. Hey, the, the arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. <laughs> Through God. Look at it. Through, matter of fact, would you read verse 12 out loud together with me? You ready? Here we go. Here we go. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that tread down our enemies. Woo! In the end, we win. But that doesn't mean that there's not some battles. As a matter of fact, the honest truth is, if you go back to the title of the message this morning, From Victory Unto Victory, that itself says, from battle to battle. But in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. One of my favorite songs I learned about 28 years ago. It's titled, I'm on the winning side. And listen to me this morning. If you know Christ, you're on the winning side. You say, Pastor, Seems like a strong battle is brewing around me. Go back to Psalm. It'd be, it'd be good for you to mark Psalm 60 somewhere in your notes. Go back to Psalm 60 and cry out to the Lord there in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then let God speak, verses 6, 7, 8, 9. And then say of the Lord, he'll do validly. He's my help. You're here without Christ today. I've got good news for you. Enlistment lines open. He's accepting any who will come and all who will come and believe on him. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.